Thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, if you joined us for happy hour, hello again, if you're just joining us now. Um, we would love if you would, you know, tweet at us, use the hashtag MinSearch. If something pops up, which there will be in Brittany's presentation that you want to share or find insightful, we would love for you to tweet at us, tweet it out. Want to give a big shout out to our sponsors. Um, special note to Rocket55, who is our virtual event sponsor. Um, they are helping us keep all of our virtual events um, that we've been doing since March completely free to you. Um, so thank you, Rocket55. Um, and then also a huge shout out to our other um, four sponsors we have here. So Rank Crankers, Click360, Nordic Click, and Hook Agency. We really appreciate your support. Um, and speaking of support, if you want to be one of these fabulous logos up here, um, just email this email down below, sponsorships at minsearch.org, um, or talk to Jason Sem. I believe he gave his uh, LinkedIn, so check that out in the chat. Um, and this is our fabulous board of directors. I think most of us are on the chat right now. Um, so yeah, that's all our faces. Hopefully you can come see us in person sometime soon. Um, so these are, this is the kind of information about our memberships. Um, I know we're not in person right now, so things are a lot different and all events are free, as I mentioned, thanks to Rocket. Um, but if you are interested in joining us um, as a member next time we do go in person, um, we would love for you to reach out. We're all happy to answer any questions if you weren't quite ready yet or, or want to know more. Um, it's just 125 a year, which math breaks down to less than $10 an event. Um, so if you are interested at all in becoming a member and helping support our org, um, email us at members at minsearch.org or head to our website. Or again, just message any one of us and we'd be happy to walk you through it. And uh, let's move on to what everyone's here for, the big show. Um, we have the fabulous Brittany Muller from Moz here. And today she's going to talk about um, kind of a modern look at the SEO basics. So. Brittany, I'll let you take it away. Cool. All right. So let me share my screen here. Hmm. I'm guessing we might need to enable your sharing as well, huh, Brittany? Yeah. Let me, okay. I think I also have to just change. You'll not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. So I might have to jump out and jump back in. Would that be okay? I think so. Yeah, sure. If, okay. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. One sec. Okay. Wonderful. I'm going to go get that guitar real quick. Okay. So um, I appreciate you all. We're really glad that you are, are here. Um, I'm getting some requests. It's a free bird. No, I won't be playing that. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, like I said, we're, we're happy that you're here. Actually, while we're waiting for Brittany, now would be a really great time for you to consider becoming a member of MN Search. So mnsearch.org, go check out the website, look at the membership options. You know, we can't do this without your support. And so whether we're here, whether we're in person, whether we're at the MN Search Summit, this thing takes, you know, some money to, to, to put on. And um, we really, really would appreciate you becoming a member. Um, we, we, we love all of our members. And so if you need some more love in your life and you want to become a member, then you will get some more love in your life and you'll be a member. It'll be great. So anyway, uh, Brittany's back and I'm guessing, I'm hoping that she'll be able to share her screen. She's sharing her screen. We are set and we're going to go back over to Brittany now and you all have a great time and enjoy Brittany's presentation. Awesome. I can't help but, be, but think about what Micah said about how he's eating his quesadilla right now. I'm just curious how it is. Uh, and I hope I can see some of the chats as they pop up here. Um, let me see. <laughs> so good. Good. I'm going to leave this open down here. Perfect. Oh okay, great. We got the chats coming in. Yeah. Right. This is going to be great fun. The way I approached this talk was um, I really structured it as if I was putting it together just for, you know, a close friend that wanted to learn highly executable modern day SEO tactics and techniques. Um, and so that's sort of how I've structured this together. 
Um, and what I'm really going to go through is three things. So covering search intent and what that really means today. Uh, modern day link building. There's a lot of really easy ways to do link building that we forget about or overlook. Uh, and then diving into local visibility, which is so important now, perhaps than ever. Um, and just want to arm all of you with the tools that I have seen be very effective during um, this time. So, uh, and I'm also curious, is this view okay? Or do you guys want me to go full screen? Um, I'm just going to keep going like It this. works. Yeah, no, it works just fine. Okay. Um, so yeah, first and foremost, understanding and fulfilling search intent. This has changed so much just even the last several years. So traditionally, we really looked at intent in these four categories. And while that's still okay to do, it has become much more diverse and multifaceted than this. And I don't expect you to read all of these on the next slide, but just to give you an idea, these are just some of the intents that Google has stated within different data science competitions. And so I like to spy on these to sort of see, you know, what Google's up to, what they're looking at getting better at. And this TensorFlow 2.0 question and answering uh, contest was incredibly insightful, most importantly due to the data that they provided to these data scientists. And it all revolved around identifying intent. And so that's where I've been able to kind of pull and keep an eye on these different intent types. I also thought this snippet was just fascinating and how you know they're really driving home how a good answer will be both sufficient and relevant. And I think that applies now more than ever, especially with featured snippets um, the different markups that we're seeing within SERPs, and I, I see it continuing to go down this realm of question and answering. Um, but to give you an idea of what those intents look like, so these were their question intents, and they essentially asked data scientists to, to create a model that would weight every single intent for any given question and answer output. And so revolving around the question, is it conversational? Is it fact seeking? Um, does it have multi intent? Is it not really a question? That one's my favorite. Um, and then it, there's intents around the type of question. So is it, you know, a definition? Is it spelling? Is it procedure? Uh, really interesting that they're trying to get this granular with understanding search, understanding content within the realm of Google. Um, they've got different answer types. So, you know, how helpful is this particular answer on any given page? Is it relevant? Does it satisfy the um, searcher's, you know, question? Um, and then we have answer types. So let me see if I can actually shut that. Uh, so, you know, is it instructions? Is it a procedure? Is it well written? So, you know, I've always sort of came from this mindset of, you know, Google is comprised of some of the smartest people in the world. There's tons and tons of PhDs on different teams doing really incredible things with algorithms. I don't think our job has ever been to outsmart them or to figure out different hacks here and there. It's really to provide the best content that's worthy of ranking. Um, and I think that's more important now today than ever. Um, I dive into this a little bit deeper on this whiteboard Friday, but I really just kind of want to showcase to, to all of you is, you know, taking a modern perspective at providing and fulfilling intent really boils down to paying very close attention to the search result page. So here I just did a search for phonetic alphabet and it was way more visually heavy on the SERP than I expected. Now this is telling me something, right? Google sees so many, you know, millions, billions of searches every day. They know what majority of people searching phonetic alphabet or your keyword are seeking. And so they've gotten very good at providing that content and providing it in a way that's really helpful to the searcher. And so I say we lean on that knowledge that Google has of sort of this digital psychology 
and extract deeper understanding by what they're showing. So you can see first is also Wikipedia informing me it's very informational based. We see those people also ask boxes, we see some videos. It's just so important to go through the SERPs with this sort of keen eye on what it is that they are fulfilling for the searcher. And I try to break this down in a um, checklist. This is a Google Sheet. And this isn't meant to be a checklist that you use every time. It's really just meant as sort of training wheels to get in that mindset of, okay, what, what is the primary SERP intent? What is the secondary SERP intent? And it doesn't, these don't have to be perfect, but just again, thinking of those things. Um, have you read and consumed all of the ranking URLs? Have you made note of the multimedia used throughout? Oftentimes you'll take a look at any given SERP and you'll go through all of the results and there's these common threads of intent or of information that you need just to be competitive. And so this is really about kind of uncovering that and doing it um, on a more regular basis without needing this checklist. Um, so just kind of walk you through some of the steps that myself and some other SEOs uh, regularly take to kind of uncover that. Um, and, you know, there's other tips in here, like uh, design a scannable content framework. I think that's incredibly valuable and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, and just really consider, you know, the content that you're providing. Will it be competitive with what it is that you're seeing on the SERP? Uh, and then this goes into, you know, the next steps of, let's say you create that content, are you repurposing it? Are you taking these sort of bonus points, next level steps to um, further your strategy? So let's take a look at just scannable framework. As Google has moved into mobile first, this will continue to be more and more and more important. Uh, people are on the go, right? Maybe not right now, but you know, <laughs> after pandemic and maybe in different situations, people will still be on the go. And you just, you don't know the situation someone's in when they're either on their phone or on their computer. And so giving them these options to quickly consume information is essential. Uh, some tips around that. I love this idea that Andy Crestedina and his team have been saying for years now is to, you know, generate 10 to 20 title ideas. And you can not only experiment to see what does best with those titles, perhaps in a paid campaign, but you can use the other titles that you don't end up using within social to promote the content. So it's kind of a great way to, to kind of generate those ideas, but then to also find value in them after they're not necessarily used. Omit needless words. This is so important uh, as Google just continues to sort of be, you know, the informational database of the web, right? They just want to provide users with quick answers uh, that are easy to consume. Um, and to really prioritize fulfilling the searcher intent. What is, what is it that that searcher is indeed seeking, right? Um, and I, I'm a firm believer that modern SEO and moving into the future, it's going to revolve less and less around search engines and Googlebot crawlers and more around people and providing value. Um, so let's talk real briefly about scannable framework. I, I realized that I was using that term a lot and I never did a very good job of explaining what I meant by that. Um, so I'd love to try to do that here. Um, you know, scannable framework is something in my opinion that I can look at on my cell phone while going somewhere and get a quick idea of what it is about. And so that involves this inverted pyramid type format, which is used in journalism. So you state the most important facts or information at the very top, and then you go down from there. Um, this also should involve a summary. I can't express enough how well we see summaries working with featured snippets. I mean, it's honestly shocking how you can take a page that's ranking pretty good for particular keywords and you add a really concise, well-written summary and it can rank for all sorts of featured snippets. So 
cannot stress that one enough. Um, I continue to get emails and messages about people using that and finding really great success. Subtitles are, I find myself, and I am I bet you guys do too, of reading content that doesn't have subtitles and it's, it's just heavy. It's kind of tough to get through. Um, and, you know, making it easy to summarize for people on the go. And I think Copy Blogger has been at the top of doing this for years. Their content is extremely scannable. Uh, so if you need examples, go check out copyblogger.com. Uh, takeaways are also great. Uh, if there's a particular section that has you know, key takeaways or specific takeaways, Google and featured snippets also love that. Uh, multimedia, I think this is interesting as far as scannable framework goes because again, you don't know if someone's walking to the park or going to pick something up maybe give them an option to listen to the content or perhaps view a video, right? There's different context um, options that, that people find valuable. Um, and so I always love a good content piece with options and I see it doing really well. Um, the social share option, now this might seem sort of outdated. I see less and less uh, bigger blogs and websites having the social shares but it's still extremely valuable to you know not only social signals engagement signals but you know kind of like the late eric ward used to always say you should be actively building links as if google were to disappear tomorrow right and that that revolves first and foremost around the people who are currently consuming your content so if you can get them to share it with a friend or to share it with someone on social um it, that's always a good thing. Relevant next steps. Uh, this is something I've also seen neglected a lot and I can understand why, right? We, a lot of us work on different websites that either house a lot of content or there's all sorts of different categories and there's not a whole lot of thought put into what would the reader logically do next? Where would they go with this information? What might they need next? Are we providing relevant next steps from this article. Uh, Raspberry Pi's website is incredible at doing this, where I will be looking at, you know, building something like this, and I don't even realize that I don't know what I'm doing with this next step, and it's already fed to me within that site. So again, just kind of putting yourself in that user mindset. Uh, I'm just gonna check on chat here. I'm so glad the quesadilla is tasting good. <laughs> Oh yeah, MozCon 2020, you guys, it's gonna be awesome. I was actually thinking uh, after this recording's up, maybe I can give you a sneak peek at some stuff for that. Um, yes. Yeah, it's crazy. It's gonna be, on. I'm not just saying this, uh, I firmly believe it's gonna be the best MozCon um, by quite a bit. Just seeing some of the sneak peeks I saw today, I mean, I fell out of my chair. I literally fell out of my chair when Rob Usby shared what he built for all of you. So. Yeah, it's gonna be super good, but anyways. Um, I like to talk about this modern link building because let's be real, link building's incredibly hard, right? It's just one of the most difficult things in SEO. It's painstaking. Um, the conversion for getting a link is painfully low, um, but there are these things that we tend to forget about that still work. So. One is just unlinked mentions. So doing search around a website's brand or a product name or a founder's name and really being able to reach out to whoever, whatever websites may have mentioned these things and ensuring a link back to your site. Um, this is probably way too old school, but I remember doing this for clients back in the day and not having much success until I would write in from multiple like different email accounts saying how frustrated I was I couldn't find this mentioned site and how I would, it would really be helpful if you could link, like it's so stupid. But thinking in terms of, you know, what sort of outreach makes sense. Um, of course, it's always helpful if you have a contact at that particular website, um, but oftentimes we don't. Um, but it's still, it's a great one to give a try because they're obviously mentioning you for a reason. So that's good. 
Um, it's a squeaky wheel. <laughs> really, that's truly probably the best definition of uh, unlinked mentions. It's the squeaky wheel, yeah, of link building for sure. Um, another sort of squeaky wheel is unlinked and unsighted images. Now this one might be a bit easier than unlinked mentions just because they're actually using your you know physical graphic content that you have on your website and so reaching out and saying hey like i saw you use this photograph of ours um you know we would just really appreciate uh, a citation or a link back to this page type of a thing those um i've seen those work very well uh this might be the easiest one on the entire list because you literally don't have to do any outreach um, so you probably already have links to your website on pages that are broken. And so there's a lot of different tools and ways you can look at that. One of my favorite ways is on Moz's top pages report where I put in mnsearch.org and I filter by status code. And so I want to see what are the 400s, what are the broken pages that have linking domains pointing to them and how might we be able to reclaim some of that link equity. Um, so that's, I mean, super, super easy uh, and you have full control over that. Monitoring recently lost links is really interesting too and I keyword here is recently. Um, so if you have a tool like Moz, I know Stat does this and a couple of others where you can monitor you know even within the last week what what links have been dropped and then investigating that further as to why and you can sometimes pick up on competitive link building campaigns where they're swapping out your content for competitors um, or perhaps they you know something broke on their site um, and maybe they're not aware of it so it's really good to um to show uh, uh, and to really go after some of those recently lost links. Don't show what? <laughs> Carrie, oh, the 404s? That's so funny. Yeah, oh, sorry. Well, it, they're not bad. They're not bad. <laughs> Opportunities, right? Opportunities. Um, okay, so this was kind of a, a very modern technique that I just recently learned about um, from Sarah Holland Beck at Siege Media. They've got such an incredible team over there. I just consistently love what they're, what they're creating. But Sarah wrote, yeah, they're the best. Sarah wrote this unbelievable article that kind of like shook the link building community. And it was really cool to see on Twitter where she basically explains this advanced idea of around link reclamation. And so basically taking current backlinks that you have that may be linked to older or outdated resources and getting them changed to new targets. Uh, she explains this way more than I ever could or in way better. So highly suggest checking this out. It was a really fascinating read and just refreshing to see some, you know, new concepts um, in the world of link building um sites that list competitors but not you right so doing those kind of strategic advanced google searches around you know what pages mention patagonia and north face but not columbia right you could do this for any website and getting really good at those advanced searches will will pay in dividends over time i can't stress that enough there's all sorts of great little hacks um one of my, I'm going to skip to one of my favorite uh, books around link building and specifically just that getting really good at how to search for opportunities is this ultimate guide to link building by Garrett French and Eric Ward. They are the two godfathers of link building, um, unbelievably talented and their updated edition blew me away. I mean, I cut my teeth on the first one, but the second one is so good and just really simple stuff like the things I'm mentioning here and creative ways to just think deeper around how it is that you're teasing out these opportunities. Um, also exploring sites that provide topic plus geo information. So, you know, think about like sites that mention Minnesota outdoor, outdoor clothing gear 
right? Maybe explore like boundary waters or you can get creative with local, locally relevant link building. And there's all sorts of avenues you can take there. Um, oh my gosh, did Garrett come? <laughs> Kevin was good. It is a great book. I love it so much. Um, oh, and then lastly, you know, in terms of modern link building, let people choose the anchor text. You know, gone are the days where we're desperately trying to convince people to link to our sites with X, Y, Z keywords. Um, people should naturally be linking to you how they see fit. Um, and so I think, you know, transitioning out of some of those older tactics will do really well. Um, and then in terms of uh, link building, and you know, it's not, it's obviously not just around these things like building links, it's also around really, really great content. And I couldn't fail to mention some of my most favorite content pieces that I've been aware of and just blown away by the last several months. Um, so just to show you two brief examples, this is an article on a casino website where the SEO teams pulled Twitter API uh, data and they were able to determine the most vulgar NBA fans based around tweets. And it's, I mean, it's one of my favorite content pieces just because everyone has a favorite sports team. Uh, people are interested in some of this stuff and the number of links that were created from this and on a casino site, you know, like this is where I just love seeing SEOs and content marketers get creative and come up with new and interesting ways to do, do campaigns like this. It's so genius. And then the other one, this one's so cool. Um, so this one in particular, the SEO went physically into, I think several courthouses around the Dallas area and was able to get public information that you can only get by filling out a form at the courthouse about DUIs and um, the success rate by all of the local lawyers for that particular year. Um, so it's literally <laughs> time relevant, right? This is, it's all current information that she was able to pull offline and put into online. And it's, I can't stress how valuable that is. I mean, best drug or wait, best drug possession or distribution attorney by win rate. How incredible is that? And there's all these public um, tableau tabs to dive deeper into this data. And I just thought it was so genius. And um, yeah, Kristen Tinsky has continued to just blow my mind with this kind of content. She has created not only these two, but so many other genius ideas and she recently had a really great talk on traffic think tank where she so transparently shared how the outreach worked around these content pieces and how many emails were sent in order to get a single backlink to the most vulgar nba fans piece like so i just i can't stress enough um go give her a follow check out what she's doing I think that is sort of the future that, you know, will set you apart from competitors is doing stuff like that. Uh, she is a genius. It is like unbelievable. I am such a big fan. It's embarrassing. Um, and then moving into this last section around local visibility. Um, so now, you know, with everything going on with the current landscape, you hear, you hear a lot traditionally around being in marketing, you really have to meet people where they are. Well, things have shifted and changed so much the last several months that you really have to sort of recalibrate and figure out where are your customers? Where, are, where is your target market? What does that look like? How have their needs changed? What, you know, what new concerns do they have and how are you addressing them? And so uh, there's, couple of things around this. One I want to first mention that Dr. Pete showed me today that I thought was so cool. And it's this Think With Google page around rising retail categories. And some of you might have seen it and might think like, yeah, it's pretty cool. I saw it. But there's sort of this hidden thing that I feel like most of us don't see where you can actually scroll through the categories and there's 
thousands and thousands of keywords on this page. So if you change that to yearly, United States yearly, and then take that category box and just scroll down, it goes down into the 300s. And every time you select a category, you get new top growing queries in that right box. And so this is just, you know, a gold mine for keyword trends, for how things are changing. I know um, some of you may know Nadia, who's an SEO up in Nova Scotia, and she noticed that for her particular area, searches around margaritas and like margarita delivery skyrocketed. And so her and her girlfriend have been selling margarita mix and doing very well. Like that's some of the most genius stuff ever. Um, I don't know that she used this in particular, but she was looking at keyword data from somewhere and I just, I love that example. Uh, and then in other terms of local, you know, Google My Business is key. Uh, we should all actively be logging into any of these accounts we have access to and filling out any new informational fields. We will continue to see new informational fields. Um, things will continue to change. Google is testing all sorts of things. One of the most important things, in my opinion, is getting this hours or services may differ warning removed from a Google My Business listing. This tells potential customers that you might not be open at all when that might not be the case whatsoever. And so by adding special hours within your Google My, Google My Business listing, you get that warning removed. And so I, I just can't stress this enough. I've, um, I've told several businesses about this and they've seen upticks in not only um, traffic, but people calling um, for booking things, uh, and it, it works really well. So just getting that warning removed, I think, is honestly half the battle. Um, and then the special hours, it's actually when you log in, it's under the regular hours, and it's sort of where you would put the holiday information, and I think it lasts about two weeks. And so just to continue to keep an eye on that and make sure you're not having that warning show up. Uh, the COVID-19 posts have been working really well. Um, so these last a lot longer than regular posts, more around 28 days. Um, they also show up in the organic area and they're really high up in your actual listing. Um, they are text only. So some of you might be used to some of the other posts that use those um, initial larger images. This is just text, but what a great way just to let people know you know, what changes are occurring with your business um, and make that, you know, very prominent. Um, and also to leverage the regular Google My Bus Business posts, um, the, you know, the visibility on that and sort of the eyes are drawn to that in particular because they are these great big photos down at the bottom of your listing. Um, and there's all sorts of different options. You can create a what's new, an event, an offer, a product. My favorite thing, let's see if it's, is it this one? Uh, yeah, you can do custom CTAs, but people have been getting so clever with this. And uh, this CrossFit gym created posts and look at their photos. So they didn't upload just a regular photo. They put curbside pickup, they put shop online, they put, um, oh, this isn't CrossFit, you know what I mean? but they put remote design as that initial image. And so they're basically showcasing services that their business is offering through posts. It's so smart and savvy. Um, oh, and this is particularly through products, which is a post option. But you know, to play around with this and to try to give businesses the visibility that they deserve and um, that really help right now, I think is key. Uh, I also love this tip to seed your Q&A with commonly asked questions. Uh, can't stress that enough that, you know, Google, we know that Google actively looks at this sort of content, but also just helpful for users, right? Again, to sort of preemptively ask those or answer those commonly asked questions to customers before they have to make a phone call or before they have to um, contact you. 
I'm a, I'm a big um, believer in answering all reviews in a timely manner. I think it's one of the most overlooked and underrated PR tactics that local businesses have available today. It's something that people searching for your particular business are going to pay attention to. And I think it just shows that you care. Um, yeah. I thought this was interesting. Carrie Hill tweeted that 97% of people who read reviews read review responses, right? And it just makes sense. Um, they wanna see how a business is handling particular things. Uh, these are a list of other uh, local tips. And I have to say, I get most of my local tips from um, uh, Gather Up and Local U. Some of the webinars they have been putting on have been unbelievable. Um, so highly suggest keeping an eye on, on those groups just because they do such a great job staying on top of some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't have to go through all these and you guys can, will get full access to all of the slides. Um, oh, I wanted to list my, I created a crisis adaptation checklist and it includes um, all of these tips and then some, um, and we really, at Moz, we try to, to organize it in ways that would be helpful to businesses and local SEOs right now. Um, and then just a reminder, you know, because these things change so often, put a reminder in your calendar to check for new Google My Business features. I am super guilty of forgetting a Google My Business listing um, and not checking on it as much as I should. And I think now is the time to continuously pay closer and closer, closer attention to that stuff. Um, but hopefully this can open it up to some questions or genius thoughts you guys have. All of the slides are at bit.ly mn search dash b. Um, and I'm excited to hear your feedback. Awesome. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Barry. Woo! Yeah. So we do have some questions. Is that right, uh, Abby? Yes, yes, we have four in the Q&A, um, and I can uh, start to go through those. Um, okay, so first one is, um, well, the first two are actually kind of similar. So, Brittany, how do you respond to the claim that guest posts have no link building value due to Google's statement that guest post links should be tagged as no follow? And then, um, sorry if I'm butchering your name, but Philippe? Heber, um, what are your thoughts on guest posting as a form of backlink building in 2020? So kind of similar questions. Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, I feel like that's so tough just because we know that Google has been saying this for years that they don't matter as much. But if you think of it in terms of, you know, take Moz, Moz's blog, for example, our editorial guidelines are incredibly strict. I mean, we don't let you link out to hardly anything without meeting different criteria. It is so well vetted. Um, our editors are kind of all over that kind of stuff. And so we, you know, we would never put no follows on that just because we've done such a high level job at vetting the content and vetting the authors themselves. Um, I, you know, I don't think there's one size fits all for guest blog posts. I think definitely it's a strong signal coming from Google that they will be placing less and less authority on different guest post techniques. Um, and so I think, you know, going back to the, what I always loved about Eric Ward and his stuff around link building, you know, you should be building links as if Google didn't matter, if Google wasn't around. And so, really considering would you get relevant traffic from that page regardless of the link would people you know what sort of or what what kind of volume do you estimate might come from that particular pages link i um, mean doing it for those reasons more so than than ranking um yeah awesome thank you so much super helpful um so next we've got ryan d's question um so Current point of view, big brands do not need to implement Google's onerous page speed recommendations because their other ranking signals are so strong. In a core web vitals world where smaller businesses don't have unlimited budget for content, offsite promotion, and dev time, where do you place speed improvements on the hierarchy of needs? Good question. 
gosh, that's such a good question. Such a good question. I think speed will continue to be more and more important, especially just as we see more and more people searching on mobile, um, that, you know, time to interactive is incredibly important. Um, and Google's been clear that they will start placing more and more weight on that. Um, and I would also, you know what, instead of just taking that and running with sort of that kind of advice across all categories and all websites, really look at who are your current competitors and where are they scoring in Web Vitals currently? What is, you know, what's the top ranked uh, URLs, how are they doing for your target keywords? What does that look like? And that sort of sets a more accurate stage as far as what do you need to be competitive? Super helpful. Um, so we have just one more. Um, so if people have more questions, please throw them in the Q&A. Um, from MinSearch's own Eric Carlson, um, is GMB as valuable to companies that operate nationally and not locally? Ooh, that's a great question. That's tough because I think, you know, I hate to say that that answer is it depends, but it really does, especially if it has potential to rank for um, non-branded relevant terms. I think that that's a differentiator. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what other people in the chat think about that one. Because I, I think it's still important to have relevant context and information, especially in terms of just feeding that to Google and feeding that to the knowledge graph. But um, I don't think it might be as important to a national business as it is to local. Awesome. And I actually scrolled past Jenny. Sorry, Jenny. Um, uh, she wanted to know, where do you add the summary? Um, in the metadata or in the content? Yeah, so definitely within the content. And I've actually seen this work really well at the top of the page, but also at the bottom. Um, and then, you know, again, within different subtext and different um, content areas of the page, you can also add really short, uh, succinct information there as well. And that's, Google loves that, right? And especially when you think in terms of voice, have you ever listened to a long voice answer? And maybe it was like three sentences, but to you, you're like, oh my gosh, it's going forever. That's kind of the world that Google lives in. And so they're trying to provide really quick, succinct takeaways, not only for featured snippets, but for voice as well. Awesome. Thank you, Brittany. And actually, I had a question on that as well. Um, for companies that maybe don't have the resources to do like design elements for these summaries within the content or at the top, do you think it still holds value to just have it as kind of like basic text, just put at top at the top or like, what would you recommend with that? Totally, totally. And I, I, um, I'm going to pick on Matthew Barbie at, at HubSpot a little bit, just because he's so wonderful. And they, um, his team has been sort of aware of, you know, this featured snippet, uh, framework, uh, putting summaries, putting kind of too long, didn't read the takeaways. But I, I noticed early on that they were doing um, kind of their own featured snippet markup. That's, uh, it's not Google markup. It's never been, but they will add that within some of the HubSpot um, summaries. And so I just find, and they're ranking for several featured snippets and it's hilarious because you know, I don't want people to, th to think that that will get you a featured snippet, but I just think playing around and having that mindset of how do I, you know, really spoon feed this to Google? What sort of things can I play around with? Um, yeah, I absolutely love that stuff. And I think that is sort of the future. And in terms of testing and playing around with different things that might work for featured snippets, Moz has had a lot of great success with um, ODN, which is now called uh, search pilot, is that right? I think it's now called search pilot. Um, but it's basically an AB testing SEO platform and the statistical, uh, awareness that that platform has is shocking. I mean, it does it all for you. So you're not trying to come up with what might be statistically significant. Um, and it doesn't, you know, you don't have to calculate, um, targeting pages that have about equal traffic it literally does all that so um we've also seen some success with that 
Awesome. Yeah, I was, Cyrus mentioned that, I think, in his presentation yeah. yesterday. So I was just on that site. It's so interesting. Yeah, so fun. All right, we've got another question from Philippe. Um, should you match your page title similarly to competitors? So for example, if those ranking at the top are using listicles, does that mean you should also create yours in the form of a listicle? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I would really pay close attention to what you see doing well for that particular search result page. I also think that something uh, that we don't talk about enough is paying really close attention to ad titles. You know, people that are doing advertising and throwing tons of money are doing their testing. Um, a lot of the paid teams and paid agencies do tons of different titles. They know what converts, they know what people click on. And so I really like to steal ideas from ads. Um, but definitely if I see several listicles, um, I would suggest, you know, if it's a good fit for your content and for what you want to try to put together for your site, you know, try it out. Absolutely. I think I would uh, uh, add on to that too. I think um, let the SERPs tell you what, what to do, I think, in any, partic any particular situation. Because sometimes you'll see it'll just be kind of in descending order. It'll be like 18 tips, 15 tips, 12 yeah. tips, 10 tips. And it's like, okay, 24 tips and you got it, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's all over the place and if there's a what and a why and a lot of the what's are represented in the SERPs and the why isn't represented but the intent is there, then do the why articles that you have like the Pepsi to the Coke SERPs that are there. So I think that's kind of, um, you know, the, the intent piece is so important because it'll inform your decision on any given piece of content. Josh, Sorry. So good. No, that was so good. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I wanted to play. I love that. Yeah, you're welcome to play anytime. <laughs> All right, we got next question from Nick Leroy. Thoughts on Google's ability to highlight answers and scroll users down a page from the SERPs? I'm curious about this as well. Oh God, just as like a human, it makes me a little sad just because I consider all of the hard work different content marketers put into crafting really, um, well-written content that leads people down different funnels or different stories um, and that doesn't always make sense when you're you know google has forced you to jump down the page you might miss some really important stuff so on that end i'm really struggling with that a little bit on the other end you know user perspective i it's already proven to be helpful for different things i've searched for um, yeah i think that's so tough i'm curious to hear if either of you or anyone uh, attending this has other thoughts around that. Yeah, everyone throw, if you are interested to share, we'd love to see some of your comments. Um, I'm, I, I kind of feel the same way. It's like, oh, it's almost painful. Like you write this beautiful article. Maybe you have like a gorgeous graphic that spent, you know, you spent hours on um, that maybe they would have been interested in. But as the user, I've found myself kind of enjoying like, oh, that's where I'm supposed to look. So it's one of those situations where, yeah, as an SEO, you might feel one way, as a user might feel another. Totally. Oh, and Nick makes a great point. You know, if on-site metrics bounces at all, factor RIP. That, yeah, for real, that is wild. Um, that's a really good point. And I've also found the yellow to be so harsh. Like it feels really intense. Um, so I'm curious, I don't think this will be the final version that we see Google release. I think they're going to test and play around with this a bit more, but you know, all those things are so interesting. Perfect. Um, so Susan, a lovely Susan says, um, asks, how do you update a featured snippet that is inaccurate, um, either than the feedback option or in, in the feedback option or schema markup? I'm sorry, what was that first part? How do you update a featured snippet that is inaccurate mm. other, other than the feedback option or schema markup? Got it. And this isn't owned by you. This is on a different site, I'm assuming. Because if it was on your site, you would obviously just try to tweak the content a bit. Um, yes, it is on a different site. Okay, so in that instance, I would maybe try to reach out to the authors from that particular piece of content and see if they might be able to tweak that a bit. I would also though be kind of careful because um, that then draws attention to the fact that they're ranking for a particular snippet and 
I have seen firsthand how sensitive snippets can be. I mean, I've switched out very minor things and lost a snippet. Um, so it's sort of interesting. It probably, it just depends on how volatile that particular SERP is or that particular snippet. Um, but if it's incorrect and, you know, I've seen this, what was the um, coffee company, uh, like Bulletproof Coffee, for whatever reason, they don't rank for any of their people also ask questions or the featured snippets that I was asking around the caffeine contents and all these things. And you would assume that they would want to own that information and they want to, would want to make it as accurate as possible. Um, and so I know they, their team was trying to reach out to the different sites that were mentioning that. Um, and I wonder if they've had success. I'm not totally sure, but to, yeah, to definitely just reach out and maybe try to get that, get that altered on the other site. Awesome. Thank you. That's the questions that we have in the q and I'm going to do another, another call for if there's any final questions. Um, otherwise, while we wait, Josh, did you have any questions for Brittany? Yeah, I just, um, I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm in search, uh, not as much at the detail level on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, as much as I used to be. I'm kind of trying to do a lot of other things. Like, what's, what's the one thing that I should like really just pay attention to or be like, wait a minute, I should not dismiss that when I see headlines about that topic. I should actually like dig into it deeper. Is there something that I've been like, you know, missing out on maybe that I should be brushing up on a little bit more so that this industry doesn't pass me by as I, as I get distracted by other marketing tactics? Yeah, that's a great question. I often feel like that too, you know, like this, it's so hard to keep on top of everything Barry Schwartz is putting out there every day or everything John Mueller is saying, you know, we hang on to every word. And I think that oftentimes, you know, putting your time and effort behind more tangible things like content or improving titles and improving meta descriptions will take you farther, right? Um, I'm also a big proponent of um, sort of, uh, someone had mentioned this earlier that they had created the Google Data Studio view of keyword opportunities. There's so many great hacks and sort of easy ways to go into like your search console and to look at what are the keywords that I don't rank all that well for, but are converting really high for us. You know, what, what would that look like if we could get that even higher? Um, so I think just maybe the only thing that you might perhaps be missing out on are just some of those um, tactics or workflows that, um, you know, there's a lot of new things coming out that will continue to make these things easier for you. I know um, I've worked really hard for my talk at MozCon to make some of these things fully accessible for free. Uh, and it would all, you know, it's all going to be at your fingertips here in a couple of weeks. And so have, um, several other, um, presenters. And so I think, you know, kind of the future and the things you do want to keep an eye on so that competitors aren't using this and, and you're not is, is some of those workflows, some of those things that really, um, give you time back, um, and to sort of automate some of the more banal things. Totally. That's a great, uh, great answer. Um, I have another question too. Um, so you talked a lot about like what we need to do if we want to rank for particular topics and, and keywords and, and things like that. Uh, I think it's always a good reminder though, too, to ask ourselves why we would want to rank for particular topics. And so I think, you know, there's a couple different schools of thought. You might have people that are like, I'm going to create a keyword list of 27,000 keywords. And then, and then, you know, there's some strength in having this holistic keyword list and maybe ranking for some of those. And then there's some people that are saying, you know, I want these seven keywords. And if I can rank for these seven non-branded terms, I'll be able to build a brand and grow a business. Um, like, how should people think about, like, why they should want to rank for a topic versus just thinking about, like, what they need to do to, do, to get that ranking? I love this question so much because you can get so kind of spun around thinking about that and considering the different options, it's overwhelming. And what has really simplified those types of, you know, questions and perspectives for me is just holding on to the primary KPI of a website. What is the primary goal for the site that you're trying to get to rank? And then sort of working your way backwards. So what, a, you know, what is successfully 
um, proven, whether it be sales or signups, um, and sort of working back and testing from there. Because quite frankly, you know, you're going to deal with clients that want vanity metrics that don't even make sense to rank for, for their particular product or their website. And so you can sort of navigate and get people more on track by showcasing, well, you know, we need to go after keywords that we can really, you know, fulfill that intent and provide value. And here's where we see potential value for your site. Here are the you know, conversions that we're currently seeing and perhaps, you know, doing deep dives on competitive pages too can be really insightful for some of those things. Um, but I think just revolving things more so around what is that KPI? What is that end goal? Because you're exactly right, Josh, like that can get really uh, convoluted quickly. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brandy. Any other questions that we've gotten having along the way or yeah. anybody else have any? Oh, no, go ahead. So Patrick's is a good question. It's a practical one. When will recording be available? Zoom crashed on me midway through. So sorry about that, Patrick. But good question. Well, I think I think our recording, I don't know when I think that's more of a question. Midweek next week is what what uh, Carrie's saying. So I think we'll be able to send that out via um, carrier pigeon, of course. Uh, that's the standard communication method for MN search. And um, yeah, so if, if uh, be on the lookout for a bird in your window next week, sometime midweek, and we'll get this video recording to you. So, all right. Any other questions here? I mean, we're getting close to our, our 730 marker here. I know, you know, for central time people, that's, that's close to, you know, <laughs> that, that's on a weeknight too. That's getting close to bedtime, you know. Uh, so uh, I think we don't have a ton of extra questions here. So at, I, I wanna just kind of transition a little bit towards the end of our programming and just say thank you so much, Brittany Muller, for joining us here tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, we, we learned so much and uh, are so uh, grateful to have representation from Moz and all of your expertise. So thank you so much. We're, we're gonna just take a minute. Everybody's clapping. You can imagine all of our uh, <laughs> participants and, and attendees are, are uh, clapping there. Thank People are saying they can feel their brain getting bigger. Oh my gosh, thank you. Nice. Thank awesome you so presentation. Much. Thank you. That's what everybody's saying. Awesome. So how can people um, learn more about uh, you, Brittany, and this, um, this kind of strange kind of off to the side brand that you work for, Moz? Um, how can people learn more about these, you and you and Moz? Yeah, so probably the easiest way to learn more about me and to connect or ask, you know, any follow up questions would just be on Twitter. And I'm just at Brittany Muller on there and just shout out to the entire community. Um, not even just the SEO community, but specifically around MN search. I mean, you guys have always done such a beautiful job with these different meetups and conferences and everyone that I have encountered through your network has been so wonderful and knowledgeable about this stuff. So any of those answers that I didn't do a great job providing to you with these questions, the, you know, fall back on the community, fall back on Twitter, SEO. There's so many wonderful people out there that are happy to support new up and coming SEOs. I mean, definitely just, you know, put yourself out there a little bit and the, the community will absolutely support you. So um, just want to encourage people to do that as well. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, and, and speaking of the MN Search community, uh, next month, July 22nd, we will have our former vice president, former, uh, actually the initial co-director of programming with yours truly, Aaron Weike, the CEO of GatherUp. Yes. So uh, Brittany, you mentioned GatherUp earlier during, during your talk tonight. Um, kind of planted a seed here. Now people are going to have to see what that's all about. We have the CEO, coincidentally, uh, Aaron, talking about their path. Yeah, you know, going from Get Five Stars, the rebrand, him just being like, you know, uh, you know, one of the guys to being CEO and just taking that company, just ma amazing um, success. Just it should be amazing. He's going to be talking about local. Uh, it'd be great next month, uh, July twenty second. Put it on your calendars. It'll be right here. And everybody, if you're on this call right now, you're invited. And then, you know, 
other people will be invited too. So if you run into them, it, it might not, you know, it shouldn't be weird. Like it'll be okay. So uh, Brittany, we hope you come back. Nikki, we hope you come back. Everybody else who um, is a member or an attendee, all of our people from, you know, Albert Lee and Thief River Falls and Fergus, you know, Falls. Fergus Falls and Bemidji and everywhere, Los Angeles, everywhere in between. We really appreciate you being here tonight and growing this community. Um, if you want, you can become a member at mnsearch.org. Go to the little member section there. We can take your payments online. We're really sophisticated digital marketers. We're really good at that type of stuff. So um, Abby, did we miss any of the announcements or, or Brittany, did we miss anything that we should be uh, telling the, the people here tonight before we bid them adieu? I don't think so. Shout out to Lakeville. <laughs> I'm just reading the chat. Yeah. Lakeville in the house. Go Susan. Exactly. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think that's about it. So again, thank you everybody for attending tonight. We really appreciate you being here. And until next time, uh, have a great, I need a sign off. I need a sign off. So keep searching everybody. <laughs>